Welcome all as CivilNet continues to cover the Armenian Society of Fellows Conference here in Dilijan, which is now in day two. I'm joined by Haik Eskandarian, a microbiologist and researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. So I want to talk about this idea which is being floated here amongst certain fellows uh, at the Armenian Society of Fellows, which is to do with new research cores or establishing some sort of uh, a few research cores in Armenia. Um, can you explain exactly from your point of view what this concept is about, what it entails, and also why there was a, a, a perception that there was a need to establish such research cores in the country? Yeah, so I, I might begin by saying that Asof had initially tasked each group of uh, members uh, in various areas of expertise to work together with the idea of building cores or centers of excellence. Uh, for the biology section, our life sciences group, I had recruited a friend, Diane Barber, at the University of California, San Francisco, whom you spoke with, as well as another friend, a professor at, uh, the, uh, at a, uni a technical university in Lausanne in Switzerland, Alex Persa, who's a bioengineer, to work together to develop a vision of how we could develop something here in Armenia, whatever it might be, a center of excellence, but what that might mean. And we thought to ourselves, we might want to take a little bit of a different approach, which is to consider what could we build, for example, here that would also be beneficial to us as diasporans, but also as just researchers in general. And so our approach was to consider if we wanted to do an experiment in biology that we couldn't do in our own institutes, wherever we are, could we, for example, build something here in Armenia that would give us the opportunity to do that? There are a few reasons why that might be the case. Uh, in many instances, experiments are expensive or risky. Um, and so uh, a lot of grant giving organizations, for example, in, in, in the Western world are very risk averse. Uh, however, if we have the opportunity to do certain preliminary experiments in core labs, for example, with technologies that we might not have available to us in our labs ourselves or within our institutes, uh, that would at least allow us to gather preliminary evidence that would allow us to, for example, apply for grants and funding that could build on itself. So in a stepwise manner, we could actually develop a research program, a new research program. Can you explain that build on itself part? Because I understand the importance of grants is, is really significant, especially in, in the research sector. How does, how does that cause like a snowball effect almost in terms of the grants and, and the technologies and, and, and research? Yeah, so um, it, might, it might be important as well to then s s or, or, or mention that the sort of research that we want to do is very fundamental. We want to understand the principles of how life manifests and why life manifests. So it's very, very basic research, fundamental research. Um, in order to, so we are interested in asking questions and answering those questions, um, philosophical questions, using biology to do that, using techniques um, and, and tools that are uh, expensive and difficult and require expertise. And so <clears throat> we develop cores in, in our own uh, institutions that allow us the opportunity to use technologies that aren't necessarily available to us in our own labs um, and for which would be too expensive to just develop necessarily on our own in our own lab spaces. So we kind of band together within departments or institutions to allow us the opportunity to do experiments that appeal to different types of groups, um, but that, that offer us all something more. And would they all pertain to life sciences? In principle, however, what, what we find is rather interesting about the way in which we consider developing a core is that we really want to highlight the, um, the, the idea of inclusion. 
inclusion demographically, but also inclusion scientifically and uh, diversity of thought. So for example, not only biologists who do developmental biology or infection biology like Diane or I do, but also engineers like Alexandre Persa or others who can not only um, uh, contribute by doing research, but also by developing new tools that really allow us to do not only research using techniques that is research that's done today, but that really drives discovery. And this idea of discovery is really critical for us because it'll, it really gives us uh, a value in the world or in the community of researchers uh, because we're driving the frontiers of knowledge forward. And that is really critical. And I think that's where we have a unique place. And your colleague friend, Diane Barber, was speaking about how students have the motivation uh, to discover. But the issue is more so the tools of discovery perhaps not being uh, available. For your average, let's say, student or researcher in Armenia that um, sees this idea about the research core. I mean, how would you explain it to them? What, what is the benefit for them as, as, their average, as the average researcher? Well, there's a future for them. I mean, they can do research. They can, research is a job. It pays. Could pay better in academia. Nevertheless, um, it, is, it is something that's very interesting and that we're very passionate about. Um, we are free to ask questions that uh, about life that we never knew about. And I think that's really, that, that, that's uh, an aspect of what drives people like Diane or myself or Ale Alex or others mm -hmm. to do research and to continue to do research in academia. Mm -hmm. um, for students here, we've realized uh, over the years that we've been coming for, for over a decade now to teach to students that they're, they're really pleased to have a vision of how we undertake a process of discovery. How do we discover that, for example, a bacterium survives an antibiotic stress to which they should die off? Um, how is it that, for example, a cell divides into two and one remains a stem cell whereas another differentiates into a heart cell? Those sorts of questions are very fundamental, but they're very interesting. Mm -hmm. And when we get into the nitty gritty of how that happens, it, it's magical, it's interesting. And I know the grant process is very complicated. It's very grueling. Yes. And I imagine it takes a lot of experience and skill to you know, successfully apply and Absolutely. receive these grants. So I'm sure you're no stranger to. Could perhaps these, uh, this core idea, these research core idea, there could be knowledge sharing, teaching people on the ground here how to do it, how to approach it. Absolutely, how to... absolutely. If we consider no one knew how to write a grant until they learned how to write a grant. It's a muscle. Um, and so the, the way grants are written now in Armenia is not as good as it could be, but that's fine. It just requires working together and building uh, an, an, uh, a support structure that allows people to be trained to, 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 to write grants better and apply for funding in various ways better than they would otherwise. And the state of the life sciences in Armenia, I mean, how would you describe it? I, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand, in terms of the various educational sectors, it, it, it is not as developed, perhaps, as, as some others. Could this also be something that will reinvigorate the sector, make it develop even further? Yeah, we think so. That's, uh, that we really want to kickstart life sciences research here in Armenia, the way it's done on an international level in Europe and in the United States or in Japan. Um, and so we want to offer the opportunity to kickstart it. I think what's cool here is that we can offer a model for how to, to kickstart that sort of program in a place where it might not exist on the level that we would want it to. So, for example, a core lab space brings value to us internationally. Yeah. Could also, it clearly can bring value to people in this country for fundamental research and also translation and also uh, uh, applied research even and the private sector. Um, and so there are many different players that can actually come together in this sort of space. That all their research kind of contributes to Absolutely. each other, right? Absolutely. It, it, and, and we really want to create these sort of nucleating sites where, for example, research is done, education is done, mentorship, apprenticeship, 
Uh, there, there is technical training on how to use machines that exist today. Uh, how can, and then as well, what are the approaches to developing new tools? Uh, that engineering aspect. All of that put together is really, really powerful. There are models in Europe and the United States that we can replicate and, and inevitably we can build something new here and a new model of our own here that, that can inspire others abroad. Okay, and finally, briefly, a question I've been asking everyone who I, I'm interviewing. What is one policy you would like to see enacted to do with everything we've been talking about? The Armenian Society of Fellows has a mission statement which is, about, which is declared that they want to take higher education and research to the next level. So not a point of I want to help and stuff, but a clear policy. I imagine the research core has been an idea that has been developed now for, for some time. Could there be a roadmap or something you can share with us of when we could see the next step? Yeah, so there is, um, there is a research community here which is organized around the National Academy of Sciences here. Um, reinvigorating this, changing, for example, the way the institutes, the research institutes work and how they interact with the universities is, is currently being done. And so that process is already going on and we just need to, we, we need to be, I think, welcomed in as foreign researchers uh, from different parts of the world, among which are even Nobel laureates. We should be welcomed in, I think. We, we might have a word or two to say. We belong to National Academy of Sciences in, in France and in Switzerland or the United States or elsewhere. And, and creating more interactions might be one, one, one way to do it. That might be a bit of a soft power sort of policy change, but it's just a, a question of speeding things up. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Heike Skandarian, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet. Thank you.